Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Hi, Terry. How are you today? I'm great, Michael. Thanks for having me on. Brilliant. You know, when I kind of reviewed you, the, the next guest that I was having on the podcast and I saw your name and I went, that's a name that's straight out of, you know, stage and screen, Terry Tucker. <laughs> it's a great name. <laughs> well, my, my dad named me because he'd read a book where there was a terrible Terry Tucker. So my dad said, I, oh. I want to have a terrible Terry Tucker. So that's how I got named. Uh, were you a terrible kid? No, I was pretty straight, you know, straight and narrow, right, right down the center. Okay. Well, of course you would say that, but would your dad say that? <laughs> uh, well, he's not here anymore. So, I, I you know, you, you write the book, you control the narrative. So that's you know. it. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Well done. Well, I'm glad Terry Tucker is on my terrible Terry Tucker is on the podcast with us. Um, thanks for coming and thanks for getting up so early to meet with us as well. Um, let me start the ball rolling by asking my first question, which is only the first question I have. Any other question I just listen for uh, and I might interject. So tell, it, tell the listeners about where, where were you born? Have you moved around your education, your first job, your career? And then love to know how you got into what you're doing today and all the great stuff you're doing for people out there. So over to you, Terry. Thanks, Michael. Uh, so, yes, I am. Uh, I was born and raised in Chicago, Illinois, uh, third largest city here in the United States. You can't tell this from looking at me or from my voice, but I'm six foot eight inches tall. And I played college basketball at a military school in Charleston, South Carolina. I've been fortunate really to have lived all over the United States, the East Coast, West Coast, uh, Gulf Coast. My wife and I now live in Colorado in the foothills of the Rocky Mountains. Uh, when I graduated from college, I moved home to find a job. I'm, I'm really going to date myself now, but this was long before the Internet was available for us to use to find employment. Um, and, you know, and I was all set to make my mark on the world with my newly obtained business administration degree. And, you know, I look back now and realize kind of what a knucklehead I was to think I knew anything <laughs> about business just because I had a degree. Fortunately, I did find that first job. I was in the corporate headquarters in the marketing department of Wendy's International, the, the hamburger chain. Yeah. Uh, but un unfortunately, I ended up living with my parents for the next three and a half years as I helped my mom care for my father and my grandmother, who were both dying of different forms of cancer. As I mentioned, my, you know, my professional career, I started out in marketing with Wendy's. I then moved to hospital administration. And then I did a major pivot in my life and I became a police officer. And I worked undercover narcotics for three and a half years. I was a SWAT team hostage negotiator. Um, I then started my own school security consulting business, was a girls' high school basketball coach, um, motivational speaker. Last year, I became an author, but for the last nine years, I've pretty much considered myself a cancer warrior as I've been dealing with a very rare form of melanoma. And then finally, my wife and I have been married for 28 years. We have one child, a daughter, who's a graduate of the United States Air Force Academy, and is an officer in the military here in the U.S. Wow. Well, that's that sounds incredible. So let's. I'd like to unpack just a couple of things there. So, how old were you when you had to, you know, live with your folks and and look after them with their illnesses? So it was right after college. So I was twenty-one. Yeah. So that's that's pretty you know, pretty scary at 21 to deal with, you know, people life limiting illness and, and, and deal with all of that. And how did that affect you doing all that? I, I mean, it was, you know, you, you're, you're young, you've just graduated from college. Um, you know, I was the first person in my family to graduate from college. So I was really kind of, you know, chomping at the bit, so to speak, to get out yeah. there and, and do something with my life. And, you know, I was kind of pulled back. I mean, I really didn't have a social life. I would 
get up in the morning and, you know, empty my father's urinal and, and get ready and go to work. And then at lunch, I would come home, get my dad ready, take him to work, go back to my place of employment. And then at five o'clock, I'd come and get my father and bring him home, get him ready for bed. So, yeah. you know, it, it was a constant, you know, dealing with th- this cancer that was was invading our family. And then my grandmother, who was in her 80s, also had cancer and was living with us at the time. But one thing my mom and dad always did, I, I have two brothers, as I mentioned, we we're no sisters. We were all uh, athletes. We, we were all uh, mostly basketball players. And my parents did a great job of instilling the importance of family in our lives. Yeah. So my mom and dad were at everything and they did the divide and conquer. You know, one son has a practice over here. I'll go to that. The other son has a game over here. I'll go to that. And yeah, just the importance of family in our lives. So when my dad got sick and my grandmother got sick, I mean, yeah, I had to put my life on hold for a little while, but given everything they had done for myself and my brothers, yes. I, I, you know, if it would have taken 10 years, I would have done it because that, that was, you know, they did so much for us. It, it was the least we could do to give back to them. Yeah, that's amazing. And, you know, well done for sticking with it, because I can well imagine at that age, it must have been tough. So it just shows you how close you guys all were uh, to be able to sustain that. And then what what made you go from Wendy's to hospital administration? How did that come about? So at Wendy's, I was uh, I started out in field marketing and eventually worked my way up to being in new product marketing. And okay. that was kind of the heyday of fast food, at, le- at least here in the United States. Yes. But I also was kind of on the downside of it when things were, you know, they were laying people off and stuff like that. And I was smart enough to realize that I was pretty far down on the totem pole. So, you know, I I may get the ax eventually. So there was a fairly large hospital in our area. It was about 1,100 beds, about 5,000 employees. And they had an opening for a new product development person. And so I was able to take what I'd learned at Wendy's in, in the marketing side of developing new products and transfer that over to helping them put new products and new services into place. So it, it just was in a lot of ways, a natural extension. And, you know, I always liked healthcare. I always liked trying to give back and helping people and stuff like that. And, you know, most of the people in, in, in the hospital were very glad I wasn't taking care of them directly. So I, this was just kind of an indirect way for me to, to be involved and make a difference in their lives. So do you think that because your father and your grandmother were ill and they obviously needed hospital treatment and and care and everything, did that influence you to kind of go into that industry? I mean, it's more of an industry in the USA than it is here in the UK because you mentioned new product development. Well, we would, you know, we would... Be quite angry if we heard that our national health service was doing new product development. <laughs> so, so it's really weird to hear that. But so, did that influence you? I think it did. I think you know, I, my my grandmother and my father both died in the hospital where I where I worked and right. had been in there on numerous occasions prior to their deaths. And you know, I, I had a I had the opportunity to sort of see it from a different perspective. And it was it was a great organization. And, you know, you want to be with good organizations, you know, quality organizations where, you know, patients and, and staff and people are put, you know, as number one and things like that. So it was not a hard decision for me to make. I, my mother was a little, you know, no, you've got this great job at Wendy's. You should stay there. And I'm like, Mom, you know, there's no guarantee that tomorrow I'm going to have a job. I think this is a good career move for me. And you know, I, she was dealing with a lot of things emotionally with my dad and and her mom who were dying. Yeah. So, it, you know, it was like, sorry, mom, I, I think this is what's in my best interest. And so I did it. Yeah, great. And how long did you do that for? Almost 10 years. Yeah, that's that's a good run, definitely, in those days. And after that, remind me, where did you go? What did you I became do? a policeman. That's it, police, right. That's a... Um, 
incredible pivot. And how were you even qualified to pivot from hospital product development, new product development into the police service? How did that, how does that work? <laughs> So I, I guess I, I can, should back up a little bit. So my grandfather was a Chicago police officer from 1924 to 1954. So and he was in, uh, you know, in the police department in Chicago during prohibition in the United States when alcohol was totally outlawed during wow. the, the Great Depression in the 1930s, uh, late 20s, early 30s. And also we, we had a big gang problem. Chicago did you know, a lot of mobsters and things like that that were shooting up the town. And he was actually shot in the line of duty with his own gun. It wasn't a serious injury. He was shot in the ankle. But my dad always remembered the stories that his mom told my grandmother of the knock on the door of Mrs. Tucker, grab your son, please. Your husband's been shot and come with us. And, you know, this was 1932 when he was shot. And so, you know, medical science had not developed a whole lot in terms of trauma and things like that. So no. fortunately, it wasn't a very serious injury. But when I expressed interest in wanting to go into law enforcement, my dad was like, oh, absolutely not. You're going to go to college. You're going to major in business. You're going to get out. You're going to get a good job. You're going to get married, have 2.4 kids and live. My dad had my entire life planned out, but it was the life that my dad wanted me to live. It wasn't the life that, that I felt I was put on this earth to live. So if you look at sort of my resume, and this will make a little more sense now, my first two jobs were in business. I had a choice when I graduated from college. I could say, you know what, the heck with you, dad, I'm going to, you know, blaze my own trail and I'm going to go into law enforcement. Yeah. Or I could do what I did is say, you know, dad, I love you and I respect you. I don't want to hurt you any more than you already are as you're dying of cancer. So I'll do what you want me to do. And, you know, I sort of joke. I did what every good son did. I, I waited till my father passed away and then I followed my dreams. So, yeah, it, yeah. you know, but I was old. I was I was a 37 year old rookie policeman, but I'd always been an athlete. So I was in good shape. But, you know, yeah. I had to go through the police academy just like the, you know, the 18, 19, 21 year old kids were doing as well. And I can oh. tell you, I took a whole lot more Tylenol than I'm sure they did. <laughs> and how long is police academy? About six and a half months. Okay. All right. That's not bad, actually. That's quite no. short. Yeah. So it's doable even if, but I mean, I don't, I mean, I don't know anything about it, but I mean, do you need some base qualifications to even get in? No. No, you really don't. I mean, I, I you know, at this point in my life, I, I, you know, I had an undergraduate degree and, and I'd been to law school I eventually got my master's degree while I, why I was a police officer. So, yeah. you know, I, I think it's important in that kind of kind of work that you have some life experience, you know, that, that you're able to talk to people. I've, I've been approached by several young people today who say, you know, I'd like to go into that field. What do you recommend? And I, and I always tell them, put your devices down and go out on the street and talk to the homeless guy there. And go up to the penthouse and talk to that guy. Because if you can talk to people, you'll be a good police officer. If you can't, you're not going to be good and you're not going to be happy in that job. Yeah. Put your devices down. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> Put your devices down. Go and speak to people. Yeah. Face to face. <laughs> Makes a lot of sense. And um, how, how long did that last, the police service? That lasted for about 10 years as well. I... Uh, you know, I, I when my wife and I met, we, I was I was a hospital administrator and, you know, we got married and we moved to California. And one day I I saw a circular that came in the mail and it was for a class that if you took at the local college, you could apply to be a reserve police officer with any agency within the state of California. And so one night at dinner, you know, I'm like, hey, hon, uh, I kind of like to do this. What do you think? And she was incredibly supportive. And I used to work at my regular job all week. And then on Friday, I would come home, put on my uniform, go to roll call, and then work all night. And I would come home exhausted. But my wife said, you always came home with a big smile on your face. And I knew that you know was something that made you happy and something you wanted to do. So when our family moved from California, when our daughter was born back to Ohio, 
uh, you know, I said, hey, I'd like to do this full time. And, you know, you think about it, you know, you marry somebody, they're in a certain position in life. You know, I was a yeah. suit and tie eight to five Monday through Friday hospital administrator. And I'm like, you know, hun, and, and I worked my entire police career at night, you know, so 11 at night till seven in the morning or when I was in the drug unit, I worked, you know, seven at night till three in the morning. So it was like, will you support me in this? And, and she did. And so when yeah. she lost her job, I needed to support her. So I had to get out of that. And we moved to another state. We moved to Texas. And, uh, you know, I started my school security consulting business. OK, so tell us a little bit more about that. When you say a school of security business, I, I, what did you do there? What what happened? I mean, what were you selling and teaching people? So basically, I was um, assessing the, the schools. and It was pr predominantly, um, you know, schools up to high school. I, I didn't do any colleges or universities. So it was, you know, grammar schools and high schools where I would go in and assess their physical security. I would write their policies and procedures regarding safety and security, and I would train their staff on what to do during a critical incident. And, yeah. you know, it was definitely something I, I, I started out with the school where our daughter went and that kind of they liked the job. I, I did that pro bono and, you know, kind of well, I'll do this. And then if you like it please tell other people. And that's kind of most of my business was word of mouth. You know, people say, hey, you know, we need to have this done. I don't know anybody. Oh, I know somebody who can do this for you. So it was a lot of fun because I was I was also coaching basketball at the time. So, you know, being your own boss, you know, during the basketball season, I would sort of, you know, not work so much on the business. And then in the in the off season, I'd ramp the business up and, and do more jobs than that. So it was kind of nice to be able to you know, balance that on both hands. That's excellent. Excellent. Okay. And now I understand it better. So you were basically a security advisor. Yeah. And was that from everything that you'd learned through police, being in the police service? I, a lot of it was, you know, I, I was on the SWAT team and, and had a lot of uh, advanced training. So I was able to use that. And, you know, plus my education and my experience, Yes. to say, yes, I can, you know, assess your, your facilities and stuff like that. And, and, and I was, I was actually fairly lucky. I, I had the opportunity to do a school that the secretary of defense for the United States, his grandkids went there. And so we had, we did a whole situation where his kids were there under their mother's maiden name and didn't have his name and things like that, just to to protect them from, yes. you know, anybody wanting to do something crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. So you're having a good ride so far. This is, you know, and how long did you do that for? Oh, uh, that's a great question. Um, so I left five, seven, about eight, seven or eight years. Okay. Good, good, long, long time. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. It, it was great. It was a lot of fun. So, then things changed for you, correct? Correct. And that then it was your health that right. caused some problems. So could you expand a little bit what happened? Sure. So 2012, as I mentioned, I was a I was a girls' high school basketball coach, and I had a callus that broke open on the bottom of my left foot, right below my third toe. And initially I didn't think a lot of it because as a coach, you're on your feet a lot. But after a couple of weeks where it didn't heal, I went and saw a podiatrist, a foot doctor friend of mine, and he took an x-ray and he said, Terry, I think you have a little cyst in there and I can cut it out. And he did. And he showed it to me. It's just a little gelatin sack with some white fat in it. You know, no dark spots, no blood, nothing that gave either one of us concern. But he said, I'll send it off to pathology and, and have it examined. And then two weeks later, I get a call from him. And as I mentioned, he was a friend of mine. So the more difficulty he was having telling me what was going on, the more frightened I was becoming until he just laid it out for me. So Terry, I've been a doctor for 25 years. I have never seen this form of cancer. You have a rare form of melanoma that appears on the bottom of the feet or the palms of the hands. And I recommend you be treated at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, probably one of the premier cancer centers in the United States. 
And so I did. I went there and I, I had the bottom of my foot uh, excised with the, with the tumor where the tumor was. I had all the lymph nodes in my groin removed. And then when I healed, I was put on a weekly injection of a drug called interferon. And the side effects were interferon uh, were that I had severe flu-like symptoms for two to three days after each injection. And I took those weekly injections for almost five years. So imagine having the flu every week for five years. And that was not a cure. That was just as my doctor used to say, we're trying to kick the can down the road and yeah. buy you more time for there to be more therapies for melanoma. Yeah. That, that ended in 2017 when I um, ended up in the intensive care unit with a fever of 108 degrees, which usually is not compatible with being alive. That was because of the toxicity of the interferon. And I had to stop that. And as soon as I did, the cancer came back. 2018, I had my left foot amputated. 2019, the disease kind of worked its way up my leg into my shin. I had two more surgeries there. And then last year, an undiagnosed tumor kind of in my ankle area uh, grew large enough that it fractured my tibia, my shin bone. And my only recourse right in the middle of the pandemic was to have my left leg amputated above the knee. And I also found out that I have tumors in my lungs, which I'm being treated for now. Whoa, Terry, that's that's (laughs) some story, my friend. Um, I, I really appreciate you being so open and sharing this with us. And I wasn't quite sure whether I should have asked you that question Um, I'm glad I did, but I'm not happy for everything that has happened to you. That's, that's dreadful. Um, and you know, it is Michael to a point, but you know, the, the way I look at it is, you know, we're all going to experience pain in our lives and it doesn't have to be cancer pain or a chronic illness or anything like that. I mean, it could be as simple as you you flunk a test at school or you break up with yes. your boyfriend or your girlfriend or you know you don't get the promotion at work that you think you deserve. Pain is inevitable in our lives. Yeah. Suffering on the other hand, suffering's optional. Suffering's what That's you right. do with that pain. You know, do you use it to make you a stronger and more determined individual or do you wallow in it and want people to feel sorry for you yeah. and you want to feel sorry for yourself? It's your choice how you want to do it. And it's nobody else's choice. You know, the world doesn't owe you anything because you got cancer. I got cancer. Yeah, it sucks. But you embrace the suck and you move on with your life the best you can. So in a lot of ways, I think cancer, and this is going to sound really weird, cancer's made me a better person. Yeah. And you don't hear very many people say that. And you know, it's, it is inevitable. None of us are going to live forever. So we are going to die from something, (laughs) Uh, whether we like it or not. And some of it can be drawn out and start early and be drawn out for a longer time. And there's pain on the journey. And some of it can be, you know, some people go very sudden too. I mean, I recently lost my uncle he suffered for many years with heart disease. You know, it wasn't pretty towards the end. He suffered a lot uh, in a lot of pain as well. And you're, you're, you're hundred percent right. There's a lot of people that are in pain. And, and my aunt told me that he never complained about his suffering. You know, he got on with life, even when he was, when he turned 81, he was a piano player and he couldn't play piano for many years because he had arthritis in his hands, but he was also a heart patient, but he could play the cello on his 81st birthday. He said, oh, I'll try it. I see I can hold my hand like this. I can, you know, she was telling me the story that he even started. He, when he was 25, he could play the cello, but he hadn't played for like 60 years nearly and he's like well let's take it up on my 81st birthday again and see if i can do it so he made the best of of his life and certainly i know from from listening to you and every and and reading about you that you are too so big high five to you thank you i i appreciate that i you know when when i found out i was going to have my leg amputated and i had these tumors in my lungs 
I went to the mortuary, I went to the cemetery, I went to the church, and I planned my funeral. And I, I got some brushback from some people about that. You know, they were like, you know, don't, don't you think that's kind of defeatist, you know, and I kind of looked at them like, oh, here, let me let you in on a little secret, we're all going to die. You know, everybody yeah. dies, but not everybody really lives. And several years ago, I heard a Native American Blackfoot proverb that I just love, and, I, and I'll share it with you real quick. It, it goes like yes. this. When you were born, you cried and the world rejoiced. Live your life in such a way so that when you die, the world cries and you rejoice. That's what I want. And I think the important words in there are live your life. You know, you've yes. got to get out there and, and find the purpose for which you were put on this earth and live that. And if you do, life or death is not as scary as opposed to those people who just kind of muddle through life. And then it comes to the end and they're like, I never did anything with my life. Hey, I want another month or I want another year. Well, yeah. sorry, you don't get that. You know, yeah. it, it doesn't work that way. Find the reason you were put on the face of this earth and live it. I'll, I'll give you, share you another quote. Mark Twain, who's a, 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 an author, who died back in the 1800s yeah. or actually early 1900s. He said the two most important days of our lives are the day we're born and the day we figure out why. So we're all put here for a reason. So many people never figure out what that reason is. That's it. hundred percent. Yeah. Thank you for sharing those quotes. Very, very important for anybody in life. Generally, you know, we, we compartmentalize our personal lives, our business lives, but it's no different. It's life. And it's, are you going to show up in, in life or are you going to hide in a corner and wish it was all over, you know, and I've seen many people that have been like that for sure. Right, Terry. So um, thank you for that journey through your life and getting us up to date. Um, your security business was running for about seven, eight years. And then what happened after that? OK, we know what happened. But what are you doing today? Or was there something else that you did in between time? Or uh, let's talk about your business today. So really, I, I don't have a business. This, this is kind of what I do now. I, I haven't worked since I've, I've had the cancer. It just seems like there's one thing after another. And, you know, I've never tried to get back in the workforce just because I didn't think it was fair to, you know, have to say, hey, you know, Every third week, I'm going to be gone because I've got to do therapy. And then those other two weeks, well, you know, I'm going to be sick and throwing up and all that kind of stuff. But if you want to employ me, feel free to do so. I did write a book last year. Um, right. It was, uh, you know, I, I never written a book before. It was just kind of one of those things that sort of, well, you know, I, I remember literally laying in bed at night being like, all right, God, what, what, where do we go now? You know, I, you're kind of at a crossroads. You don't have any goals. You don't have any... What, what are we going to do? And people were like, you should write a book. And I was like, I'm, I'm not a writer. You know, that's, yeah. that's not what I, but I think I'm smart enough to realize when enough people start saying that, you know, there's that old joke about when we talk to God, it's called prayer. When God talks to us, it's called schizophrenia. So, you know, God never <laughs> talked to me, but I think what God did was put people in my life that, you know, kept saying, you should write a book, you should write a book, you should write a book. And I think I'm smart enough to realize that when that happens, maybe I ought to kind of perk up and and, and take you know notice of that. And, and so I started to write a book. OK. And what is the book about? So the book is called Sustainable Excellence, the 10 Principles to Leading Your Uncommon and Extraordinary Life. And it was really a book that was kind of born out of two conversations. One was with a former basketball player that I had coached in high school who had moved to the area where my wife and I live with her fiance. And we had had dinner with them a couple of times. And I remember saying to her one night, you know, I'm excited that you're living close and I can watch you find and live your purpose. And she got real quiet for a while. She kind of looked at me and she's like, well, coach, what do you think my purpose is? I said, I have no idea what your purpose is, but that's what your life should be about. Finding the reason you were put on the face of this earth and then living that reason. So that was one conversation. And then I had a young man in college who reached out to me on social media and wanted to know what I thought were the most important things he should learn 
to not just be successful in his job or in business, but in life overall. And I didn't want to give him the, you know, get up early, work hard, help others kind of thing. I wanted to see if maybe I could go deeper with him. So I, I spent some time and I wrote some notes. And eventually I had these 10 thoughts, these 10 ideas, these 10 principles, and I sent them to him. And then I kind of stepped back and I was like, well, you know, I got a life story that fits underneath this principle, or I know somebody whose life emulates that principle. Right. So literally during the three month period between the time I had my leg amputated and the time I started chemotherapy for the tumors in my lungs, I sat down at the computer every day while I was healing and I built stories underneath each of the principles to kind of, you know, it's like, hey, these are not just abstract thoughts. Here, here's, a, here's a concrete example of a real human being, you know, who, who took this or did this or got it out of whatever the, the principle is. And that's how sustainable excellence came about. Wow. I mean, it it is also a mirror to your life, isn't it? Because the excellence that you've shown through all of the kind of jobs that you did, including the excellence that you showed in looking after your father, your mother, grandmother, and living with them, it's 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 a perfect summary of you as a human being too although you are chronicling other people's stories to try and show you know the examples for those 10 principles they are also in having listened to you you know for about half an hour or so it is also kind of emulates your life and what you've done. And, and so, yeah, it's logical. I think it's logical. And I'm glad you took the time to write it. And how quick did you write it? Three months. That's ridiculous. I mean, well, I didn't have anything else to do. You know, I mean, I was <laughs> healing from my amputation. So I was like, well, I could sit and watch television or I could do something productive. So yeah, you could have vegged out and watched Netflix all day, right. like most people did during lockdown. Uh, but you decided to do something, <laughs> uh, which is incredible. And uh, what kind of response have you been getting to your book? It's been outstanding. I, I mean, I've, I've got five stars on Amazon with all the reviews and things like that. I, you know, it's funny. I remember when you know the book got published. I was like, okay. First of all, I've never written a book before, and I've certainly never had a book published before. What do I do? And I was like, you know, I've got to sell books. I've got to sell books. I've got to sell books. And I had a, a best-selling business author over in the United Kingdom who I connected with on LinkedIn kind of pull me aside. And he said, Terry, you're missing the point. Your job is not to sell books. Your job is to help people. If you help people, the books will take care of selling themselves. And I was so thankful and grateful that he yeah. kind of pulled me aside and did that. I mean, he's, the guy's written like, you know, 15 books. So, I mean, he was, you know, certainly an expert to tell me, but, you know, you, you just never know as an author. I mean, is it resonating with people? Are people getting anything out of it? And one day I had an 87 year old man who apparently bought the book, read it, and then out of the blue contacted me. I had no idea who this guy was and yeah. said, you know what, if I would have had those 10 principles when I was younger, I would have had a much better life. And I thought, okay, you know, maybe I've got something here that's really going to help people. And it seems to have taken off and, and done that. And, and that makes me incredibly happy. It's fantastic. But how did you, not having written a book before, how did you go about, you know, starting it, but then also knowing what to do once it was written and get it published? What was the process for you on that? Yeah, it, it, you know, I've been asked that several times and, and, and I wish I had some great formula to give to people, but mm. this is what I did. I, I, I gave myself two rules and only two rules. I said, I will write at least one page every day, except Sunday, I took Sundays off. I'll write one page every day and I will not edit anything until I have the first draft done. And there were certainly days when I sat down at the computer and started typing and I was like, this is absolute garbage. There's no way this is ever going to make it into a book. But then the next day, 
I wrote something that was good, you know, or at least it felt good. And so when I had this manuscript, I had a, a friend of mine who said, hey, I know this individual. And, and this, is a, this is a great story. His name is Scott Silverian. And Scott was uh, in, a, in a drug unit as a policeman for a long time in the state of Louisiana. And then he became a police chief in Louisiana. And one of his friends said, hey, will you come out to California and put on a presentation for authors who want to understand police tactics and so they can put them in their book and, you know, things make sense and, and run the way things normally do. And he's like, yeah, sure. No problem. You know, free trip to California. I'd be happy to do that. And he goes out there, puts on this presentation and he ends up meeting his wife, who is a best selling New York Times. She's written like 34 or 35 best selling fiction books. They get married. He gets out of law enforcement and they start this small not for profit publishing company. So my friend hooked me up with Scott and, you know, he's like, we talked for several times and said, you know what, let's do this. Let's get, let's do this project. Let, you know, and I had never written a book before. And as I said, and, you know, I've never had a baby either, but this book was as close to, you know, <laughs> being a mother as I've ever come, but it, it, you know, so I had all these editors, I had three different editors and they would go through the book and they would send me, suggestions, you know, take this out, add this, expand this, you know, and I was kind of like, you know, who are you to tell me this is my book, you know, and, and, and I was like, all right, I'll sleep on it. And I, I'd say 99% of the time, I'd get up the next morning and be like, wait a minute, these people do this for a living. This is their job. They're experts at this. You know nothing about this. Just shut up and do what they tell you to do, because they know what they're doing. And and I did. I, I think there was maybe one suggestion that I'm like, no, I want to leave that in. That's important to me. But the rest of them were great. And it's the editors, I think, that make the book, you know, especially for a new author who, yeah, I think I got a book, but I have a real rough manuscript. You're going to make it into a book. Yeah. Wow. So you had editors You ha and, and did he publish it then? He through yeah, his, his company, it's called Five Stones Press, uh, published it. I mean, they did the, the cover design. They, I mean, you know, they, they sent me a cover and like, what do you think? And, you know, I was kind of showing it to my family and my brothers. And they're like, eh, you know, yeah, I don't know about this. And yeah, I'm like, no, I don't think so. Give me another design. And, you know, it's like, well, you know, th they want to kind of pick your brain. What do you like? What colors do you like? What are you thinking? And, you know, it was 10 principles and, and the cover ended up being kind of a, 10 like large stones that kind of form a path that go up from the bottom of the, the cover to the top and, you know, the titles at the top and it's kind of a misty, you know, it's not real clear and things like that. So you're, you know, it, it sort of mimics the book as, well, here are these principles. Can you apply them? You know, here are the 10 steps, here are the 10 principles. So it ended up working out great and it was a great experience for me. And who knows, maybe I'll do it again. <laughs> that's interesting yeah <laughs> and what are you hoping apart from getting lots of people to buy the book um are you going to do anything else perhaps with it are you going to you know speak about it do presentations using it i i, I started that before covid hit and then you know covid happened and you know, I ended up losing my leg and things like that. So I, I spend time now, um, you know, I, I'm in treatment for the tumors in my lungs. I, I Every third week I go yeah. and then I have two weeks off. And my wife and I kind of have a, a disagreement from time to time that, you know, I love to do podcasts, you know, just like I'm doing with you to tell my story and try to make a yes. difference in somebody's life. And yeah. so, you know, I, I, I've done probably a couple hundred podcasts from all around the world. And, and it's it's just a way for me. It, I, I don't, you know, and I'm sure this my, my publishers are going to be happy about this. I mean, I don't care how many books I sell. It's not about a number. I don't check the numbers or anything like that. It's about making a difference. It's about having somebody read it and say, oh, you know what? I'm going to do this or I'm going to apply this or I'm going to stop doing this or whatever it is, making a positive difference in somebody's life. And and I think that's part of, you know, I've always believed as, you know, I played team sports when I started at nine and went all the way through college. 
And I think one thing team sports taught me was the importance of being part of something that's bigger than you. You know, you know that if you don't do your job, not only are you letting yourself down, you're letting your teammates down, your coaches down, your fans down, your parents down, et cetera. And if you think about it, the biggest team game that we all play is this game of life. And so, you know, being part of something that's bigger than me, I, I hope that's what this book ends up becoming. And, and if it helps people, if it helps one person, it was worth what we did to write it. Yeah, brilliant. I, I, it's a great philosophy to have because I've definitely seen authors who've written books, maybe a couple of books. They got a garage full of them. And either what happens is they give them away as like a business card, which is also great, you know, I'm sure some of that must must happen as well to get yourself known out there and get reviews. But also they keep going on about the fact that they've got a garage full of books and they need to sell them. <laughs> you know, so they get very hung up about the item itself and turning it into cash yeah. rather than the philosophy of the more people I can influence with these stories and these principles the better it will be for those individuals and the world at large, because you only need to influence one person to get that wave, you know, potentially of happening. If somebody gets it, they influence somebody else, they get it, influence a couple more people, you know, that could go all the way around the world. And that will be a beautiful thing. Yeah, it, it really will. And, and, and that's, you know, that's why I do these podcasts. You know, it's it's yeah. not about me. It's about who can we make a difference? You know, and it's it's good people like you that allow me the opportunity to come on. And and between our conversation, you know, if, if we touch one person, if we make a difference in one person's life, today's been a good day. And, and that's kind of the way I look at it. I, I, I don't have any great, you know, visions of grandeur or anything like that. I mean, somebody told me early on, it's like you don't write a book to make money. You know, you, you don't write a book to get famous because that's that's not the case, at least in the United States. I mean, there yeah. there are 800 books published every day in the United wow. States. Yeah. You know, I mean, so what are you going to do to make your you know, you just have to do put the best product you can forward. You know, there are podcasts I go on. I never mentioned the book. You know, there are other podcasts that want to just talk about the book itself. So it, it doesn't matter to me. Like I said, it, it's not something I. I did to make money or to get famous. It's something I did to try to help people. Yeah, it's it's interesting because it mirrors my philosophy about this podcast. It's exactly the same. I'd like to make a difference for people and help people. It wasn't to go and have adverts on my podcast and have millions of listeners. If it can help just one person, um, then I, you know, I've done my job. And also, I think. I don't know if it was the same for you, but for me, it was an experiment. The podcasting was still relatively new for business people to do, you know, okay, more famous people and were doing it, but it was an experiment for me to learn how to do it and go, can I do this? Can I make this happen? How does it all work? What are the inner workings of podcasts? You know, how does it, and now I'm on like 25 channels, this podcast, and it's like, slowly and surely it just expands and you know it sounds like you did similar with the book you know you just started with step one and then all of a sudden somebody recommended somebody and it just took off so it's it's a great i mean it's a great story in its own right you know once you make your mind up to do something things will happen to help you along that journey yeah, they will. They really will. And, you know, I, I, when I talk to people, a lot of times I'll tell them, it's like, you know, you, you want to get, you know, I want to get better at, you know, whatever marketing, I want to get better at sales, I want to get, you know, and so there's this big sort of bubble out there that I've got to get better at this. And, and I think what I learned from the book was, no, you, you have to break that down into, you know, manageable parts. And a lot of times what I'll tell people is, what if you just got 1% better every day. You know, at the end of 30 days, you're 30% better than when you started. And it's a whole lot easier to get 1% better every day 
at selling than it is to say, I need to be a better salesperson. I mean, that's too abstract. That's too large. That's not something you can wrap your, you know, your hands around, your head around. Get 1% better every day. And if you do that, eventually you're going to get to your goal, but you're going to get to it at a, at a manageable and an incremental kind of way. Yeah. Yeah. That's brilliant. Yeah. And um, would you, do you have from the top of your head, uh, <laughs> or you can refer to something, but could you read out what the 10 principles are? Have they got titles? They do. So I'll, I'll give you, yeah, each chapter is a principle and, and I'll give them, and it's always fun for me as an author because they're not in any particular order. You know, number one is not any more important than number seven or anything like that. But when I talk to people who have read the book, there are, there's always one principle that kind of, okay, this is the one that I gravitate to. And, or, you know, this is the one I gravitate. And it's fun for me to see which one people, you know, kind of gravitate to. So I'll give you the, I'll give you the principles. Principle number one is enjoy your life. Principle number two is, and this principle number two is the one that resonates with me. And it's this, most people think with their fears and their insecurities instead of using their minds. And, and I know I've done that probably a million times. Most of us have. Number three is you were born to live an uncommon and extraordinary life. Number four is always remain curious and ask questions. Number five is you are the person that you're looking to become. Number six is put your God and your family before everything else. Number seven is be part of something that's bigger than yourself. We just talked about that. Number eight is fail often, especially when you're young. Number nine is listen more than you talk. And number 10 is love is the most important word in any language. Ha, uh, yeah. Well, quite a few resonate with me. There's no doubt about it. And they are amazing principles. And how long did it take you to come up with those? I know you wrote the book in three months, but you must have had some inkling of those for a while. Yeah, I mean, it'd be probably before I responded uh, to that student that had asked me that, um, I, I probably spent, you know, four to six weeks just, you know, kind of carrying a pad of paper and a pencil around and, you know, just writing notes and thoughts. And eventually those kind of, you know, were pared down into, OK, that can go with this one or this can go with that one. And, and then I had these 10 principles. So, you know, I, I'd say four to six weeks is probably what it took me to eventually come up with that list. Yeah. That's pretty quick. That's pretty quick. I have to say, yeah, I think I would have taken a lot longer. But I, I don't know. You're a pretty smart guy. I think you probably could have done it too. <laughs> well, the thing is, I think the point is everybody thinks it's harder than it is anything, right? And once you take the first step, the second step is easier. The third step is easier, etc. It's like creating a new habit. There was a guy I followed. Leo Babuta, and he was in California. I think he might still be there. And he talked a lot about habits, creating habits. And he said, you know, if you want to become a marathon runner, you got to start with one step. And the first step on day one might be put your trainers by the side of your bed when you get up in the morning. That might be step one and don't do anything else. Step two might be Take the trainers downstairs and put them by the front door. So that's day two. <laughs> day three, put them on and step outside. Can you do that? <laughs> yeah. So there were like micro small, it's like your 1%. It's like the tiniest steps to do anything, to start anything and to change anything in your life. And... Yeah, it's a, it's a great reminder for me, <laughs> you know, with any kind of new project starting off, you just got to start that because that is actually the hardest thing. Writing a book, the thought of it is the hardest thing. But taking that first step is the hardest thing to start writing, <laughs> you know. Yeah, if you, 
if you do that, you know, again, like I said, I, I totally agree with you. You know, I was a little intimidated by the process. And but if you kind of pare it down to, OK, you know, two rules. One, I'm going to write just one page a day. That's all I have to do every day, you know, and then two, I won't edit until the very end. You know, writing one page is a whole lot easier than writing a book. You know, again, it goes back to, you know, if I've got to, I've got to be better at sales. Well, what if you got 1% better at sales every single day? What if you wrote one page every single day? I mean, eventually, you know, after 100 days, you're going to have 100 pages. Now, now, it may not all be good. You know, you may have to throw some stuff out. But there are days when I did write one page. But there are also days that I wrote 10 pages because I, you know, the, the feeling moved me, so to speak. And, you yeah. know, I, I think it's that fear, that, that intimidation that, oh, my God, this is so overwhelming. I can't possibly do that. And that's why I always recommend to people, every day of your life, you should do one thing that, that scares you or that's uncomfortable. Because if you do that and you overcome that thing, whatever, how big or how small doesn't matter, when it comes time to do these big things or face these big challenges in life, you're going to be like, hey, I took care of that, 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 that. You're going to have what it takes inside of you and you're going to believe that you can do it. And that's half the battle right there. That's awesome. Thank you for that. That's such good advice. So, Terry, um, is there a question that I haven't asked or is there something you would like to share that we haven't covered? I, I'll, I'll, I know we're, we're wrapping up. I'll leave you with this, this final story. Um, I've always been a big fan of Westerns here in the United States, Cowboys and Indians kind of thing. Yeah. You know, my mom and dad used to let me stay up late and watch different shows and that when I was younger. 1993, the movie Tombstone came out. You may have seen it. Uh, it starred Kurt Russell as a man by the name of Wyatt Earp and Val Kilmer as a man by the name of John Doc Holliday. Now, Wyatt Earp and Doc Holliday were two living, breathing human beings who actually walked on the face of the earth. They're not made up characters nice. for the movie. And in Wyatt was a lawman his entire life. He'd been a, a marshal, a deputy uh, U.S. marshal, a town sheriff. And Doc was called Doc because he was a dentist by trade, but pretty much he was a gunslinger and a card shark. And these two men from entirely divergent backgrounds formed this very close friendship. And at the end of the movie, Doc is dying at a sanitarium in Glenwood Springs, Colorado, which is about three hours from where I live. And the real Doc Holliday died at that sanitarium. He's buried in the Gosh. Glenwood Springs Cemetery. And Wyatt, at this point in his life, is destitute. He has no money. He has no job. He has no prospects for a job. So every day he comes to play cards with Doc, and they pass the time. And in this scene, they're talking about what they want out of life. And Doc says, you know, I was in love with my cousin when I was younger, but she joined a convent over the affair. But she's all that I ever wanted. And then he looks at Wyatt, and he says, what about you, Wyatt? What do you want? And Wyatt kind of nonchalantly says, I just want to lead a normal life. And Doc looks at him and says, there's no normal. There's just life. And get on with living years. You know, Michael, you and I probably know people who are kind of sitting back and be like, you know, when this happens, I'll have a normal life. When that happens, I'll have a successful life. When this happens, I'll have a significant life. What I'm saying is don't wait. Don't wait for life to come to you. Get out there. Find the reason that you were put on the face of this earth and live that reason. Because I promise you, if you do that at the end of your life, you're going to be a whole lot happier and you're going to have a whole lot more peace in your heart. Wow, that's brilliant. Thank you for that. I love that. It's a great story to talk about those, those guys in the, in the Westerns. Yeah, absolutely yeah. amazing. Thank you, Terry. How can people find more out and get in touch with you about the book or where can they get the book? Um, so the book, you pretty much can get anywhere. You can get a book online. You can get it at Amazon, barnesandnoble.com, Apple iBooks. It's in ebook form, paperback and hardcover. Um, in terms of finding me, I have a, a blog that I do every day. I put up a thought for the day along with a question to kind of get you to think about that thought. On Mondays, I put up the Monday morning motivational message which is a lot of times is a video or a story that's a little bit longer. Uh, and that's at motivationalcheck, 
dot com. You can also get my social links to my social media accounts there. You can leave me a message. You can actually buy the book there as well. That's great. Well, I'll make sure all these are in the show notes and people can find you and Google you. I'm sure they'll get in touch and, and want to learn more about the book and get it. So thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I wish you continued strength and determination on your warrior journey uh, and all the treatment that you're having to undergo right now. I think you've got 100% the right mindset to deal with this. And yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure hearing your story and learning more about you. Thanks so much for coming, Terry. Well, thank you, Michael, for having me on. It's been great talking with you. Thank you so much. Take care. You too. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please rate, subscribe, and share at will. I'm always looking for more listeners and guests, so do get in touch, please. You can find me pretty easily by searching for Staying Alive UK. Thank you. Staying Alive UK. Share your story.